morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you uh, this morning to the latest session in the Chagas Research Insight webinars. Um, the purpose of these webinars is to display the latest in Chagas research. I hope you had a nice St. Patrick's Day and enjoy the beautiful weather we're having currently. My name is Pat Dillon, and I'm head of the Animal and Grassland Program in Chagas, and I will be your host this morning. The title of this morning's webinar is New Technologies to Increase the Sustainability of Milk and Beef Production. The, the, the webinar will discuss the development of new technologies in relation to heat detection, sex semen, IVF technology, and male fertility. This webinar also coincides nicely with the Chagas ICBF Breeding Week that's happening this week. We have three speakers this morning. The first will be Stephen Moore, which will talk about new developments in heat detection, automatic heat detection. Secondly, we have Stephen Butler, which will talk about sex semen and IVF technologies. And lastly, then we have David Kinney, which will speak about the importance of early nutrition of young bulls. Each presenter will speak for approximately 15 minutes. When the three, three speakers are finished, we will have opportunities about 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers. Attendees should use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen in order to submit your questions. It might be also helpful to name the presenter to whom the questions are being addressed. So without further ado, we'll progress to our first speaker, which is Stephen Moore, which will talk about new developments in heat detection, about automatic heat detection. So over to you, Stephen. Good morning, Pat, and good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining. Um, so we're going to discuss automated heat detection this morning, and I'm going to go through, first of all, the importance of high heat detection rates to achieving high reproductive performance in our pasture-based herds. I will then go on to discuss what are the main signs of heat that farmers are observing during the breeding season to achieve high uh, submission rates. I will then move on to the recent developments in automated heat uh, detection technologies. And I'll finish up then with some of the main considerations um, affecting their, their adoption on, on, on farms. So why is fertility so critical to dairy cows and to achieving high levels of milk production in pasture-based herds? Well, in pasture-based herds, we aim to have a compact calving period in the spring of, of in the three months of spring, which, and we target to have 90% of the herd calved in the first six weeks of the calving season. But to achieve this uh, very high calving rates, we need to achieve very high fertility rates during the previous uh, breeding season. And in Ireland, we have um, a target for the three week submission rate, which is the proportion of the herd that is bred during the first three weeks of the breeding season. And this is a key driver of herd fertility in pasture based systems. So in Ireland, our target is to have 90% of the herd submitted for AI during the first three weeks of the breeding season. However, we know from data provided from the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation that on average, only 71% of spring calving cows are submitted for AI during the first three weeks of the breeding season. So this is a 20% below our targets. And this has major cost implications on farms for, for poor, because of poor reproductive performance. And Chagas estimates that during the breeding season, each missed heat, it costs the farmer 250 euro per cow. So this, this has uh, considerable consequences for overall farm profitability. So what does it look like when a cow is in heat? And what are the main signs of, of heat that, we are, that farmers are looking for? So I'm going to begin with this video of a group of cows that are in heat. And you will notice that they have gathered together. They are mounting each other. Here is a cow that is uh, standing to be mounted by um, her herd mate. And they are, you can notice lots of activity. And again, here is another cow that is standing to be mounted. 
So standing to be mounted is the gold standard indicator that a cow is in heat and ready for breeding. However, there are other uh, measurements, um, cow level measurements that we can monitor and that um, automated heat detection devices have focused on. So we know that at the hormonal level, cows, when they are in heat, will have decreased levels of progesterone and increased levels of estradiol. As you could see from the video, they also display increased level, levels of physical activity. And the, during this time, they eat less, so their rumination and feed intake levels are also decreased. Okay, so I, the next few slides are going to go through some of the, the devices that have prioritized these areas. So what, what actual are the heat, main heat detection aids available to farmers? Well, it, it started basically in the 1970s with the use of tail paint. And this tail paint is the simplest, it is the cheapest, and in Ireland, it is the most widely used heat detection aid. And it involves simply um, applying a strip of paint to the tail head of the cow uh, during, at the beginning of the breeding season. And when other cows are mounting on this cow, the paint is removed. And this is the indication then to the farmer that, uh, that this cow is in heat and ready for breeding. The next major really changes in automated heat detection began really in at the turn of the century um, with the arrival of accelerometer technology. And the main devices are usually either a, a, a neck based uh, collar or else an ear tag. And these accelerometers measure the physical activities and movements of the cows um, and indicate then when they are in heat during increased levels of activity. Um, a few years ago then, another device arrived on the market, which is a simpler device called a Flashmate. And this is a battery operated device, which is glued on beside the tail head of the cow. And it's a touch sensor. So, so when there is a, a critical number, or a threshold number of contacts um, reached or measured by this device, it flashes, alerting the farmer that the cow is in heat. The most recent development then is inline milk progesterone monitoring. And this, these devices allow uh, commercial farms to monitor each in the milk progesterone levels on each individual cow automatically so that they can develop progesterone profiles for cows. And these are, this is a, a new area for heat detection. So I'm going to go through some of the devices now and how do they work? And I'll begin with the accelerometer technology. As I mentioned in the previous slide, it can be either neck based or, or, or on the ear tag. So if we look at this activity profile here, we can see that the, the hourly measurements are on the x-axis and the activity levels are on the y-axis. And the gray bars let measure the, or indicate the activity levels for this particular cow. And as you can see here, her, this is the normal average activity levels for this particular cow. But then her activity levels begin to increase. And when these levels reach a threshold level of activity, when the cow is in, in heat, then you can see that there is associated increases in activity, indicated by the green bars here. And then when the cow is no longer in heat, her activity levels decrease again. You'll also notice this green line here, which is, indicate, is indicating the rumin, rumination activity level, or rumination levels in this cow. And you will notice that at during peak heat activity, the rumination levels are decreased. So the, the, these uh, accelerometer devices use all of this information to accurately indicate when cows are in heat. We're often asked um, how accurate are these accelerometer devices for detecting heat? And so we set up a study um, to, to, uh, to determine this. So we know that when progest so progesterone can be measured in milk. And when a cow is in heat, her progesterone levels, assuming it should be low, okay? And we know that when an animal is not in heat during the breeding season, that her progesterone levels should be high, assuming that she has um, resumed her estrocyclicity. So, 
we were able to compare the heat alerts from the activity monitors and the milk progesterone. And we compare when and if there was a heat alert and the progesterone was low, this was indicating a true positive heat alert. However, if there was a heat alert and the progesterone was still high, this was indicating a false positive measurement. So when we analyzed this data, 90% of the heat alerts were identified as being true positives, indicating that the accelerometer technologies were highly accurate at indicating when cows are in heat. Now you'll notice here on the slide the, um, the lab work that we had to do to measure the milk progesterone. And I will discuss later um, the inline milk progesterone measuring technology that does all of this work automatically. So in our recent work, we have also been interested in when do cows come into heat and for how long are they in heat? So this is very useful information for farmers to have. So in this study, we were measuring their mounting behavior and we were also measuring their activity during the breeding season. And I've summarized some of the results here in this graph. And I, to do this, I broke down the onset of heat into four hour segments during the day. And then we're looking at the onset of, of the mounting behavior is indicated in the red bars and the onset of the increased activity is indicated in the blue bars. And what you can see here is that the, uh, during the breeding season, the onset of the mounting behavior, so this is when the cows started to be mounted, was roughly evenly distributed throughout the day. However, when we looked at the increased activity levels, 65% of cows, their the onset of their increased activity, which is measured by the activity monitors, occurred between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. So this is a period when cows would not be routinely measured, monitored, but, but, but they are quite active during this period. So when we looked again at, or in a bit more detail at the mounting behavior of the animals, when the cows were in heat, we, uh, um, is, the cows were in heat for on average of nine hours, okay? So this is the, the normal time for a cow to be in heat and to be mounted. However, less 55% of cows were in heat for less than eight hours, okay? Then when we looked at the activity behavior, cows had increased levels of activity for on average 17 hours, which interestingly is almost twice as long as that they are actually standing to be mounted. Some other information that the study provided was is that late calving cows, so cows that calve in April, they are mounted less. So they, stand, they are less active during the breeding season when they are in heat, compared with their herd mates that are calved in February. So this is, indicates that it will be more difficult to detect late calving cows in heat. Our study also revealed that when insemination occurs within two to four hours after the onset of, of the heat, that cows are less fertile compared to when they are inseminated after four hours after the onset of heat. So, Moving on now to some work that, uh, or just to describe the technology that's available for the inline milk progesterone analysis. So these devices have begun to appear commercially on dairy farms. They um, allow um, for the individual and automated uh, milk sampling and the measurements of milk progesterone, okay? And having these milk progesterone profiles allows us to determine the estrous cycles of the cows, identify cows that are anestrous or have cystic follicles, and to uh, determine which cows are likely to be pregnant. So I'm going to go through this milk progesterone profile for a particular cow, and we'll describe what this technology can do. So on the, on the x-axis is the days in milk, and on the y-axis is the milk progesterone concentrations. And with this technology, the milk progesterone begins to be measured approximately three weeks after calving. And then there's a rise in milk progesterone and then a decrease in, in the milk progesterone. So this would be the cow's first estrous cycle. And then 15 to 20 days later, 
there is again a, an increase in milk progesterone and then it, another decrease in progesterone. So this is the cow's second estrus cycle. And you notice here that the, the frequency of the sampling increases when milk progesterone is high, highest so that it can accurately determine when is the best time to AI the cow. So in this example, the cow is inseminated when she was in heat, and then as expected, the milk progesterone increased again and maintained at a high levels. And because of this high level of progesterone is indicated, we determined that this cow would be pregnant. So just to finish up with some considerations for the adoption of automated heat detection on pasture-based farms. So in there, we believe that there is a role for these technologies to increase the submission rates when existing poor submission rate on, is, on farm, is on farms. The devices may also be useful for identifying during the last few weeks of the breeding season, the, the small number of non-pregnant cows because these are going to be less active and most difficult to detect in heat. These devices also have a role where labour is limiting on farms because, as I've outlined, they provide continuous monitoring of estrus behaviour. And they can also be linked to the farm's drafting system to make the searching of cows for breeding very, very quick and efficient. The use of these technologies may also allow for, the, for farms not to have stock bulls on farms and for the farms to move towards 100% AI use. These devices are also particularly useful for estimating uh, the correct time of AI, which these devices can do. And this may be particularly useful when sex semen is been used, as will be discussed later by Stephen Butler in the next presentation. However, obviously this, these te technologies, there is a high um, investment cost and, and routine uh, maintenance cost. And th th this, is, this is probably a major concern that is going to affect their, their adoption um, on, on dairy farms. So just to conclude, um, submission rates, achieving high submission rates are critical to achieve high reproductive performance. We currently on average 71% during the first three weeks, and we need to uh, get that on average up to 91%, 90% uh, during the breeding season. There have been some major um, advances in the, or the automated heat detection uh, te the technologies, beginning with the accelerometers and moving more recently towards inline milk progesterone analysis. Um, we here in Chagask and other groups internationally have done a lot of research work to evaluate these technologies, and they are accurate. However, the, the high cost of these devices is currently a major limitation to their adoption on farms. So I'd like to thank you everyone for your attention, and I will hand it back to you, Pat. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks very much, Stephen. I think the stat there that stuck out in my mind was that 55% of heats have less than eight hours standing, showing the real requirement for heat detections on dairy farms to get high submission rates. Okay, so we we'll move on to our second speaker now, uh, Stephen Butler, which will talk to us about sex semen and IV IVF technologies. So over to you, Stephen. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Pat, for the introduction. So for the next 15 minutes here, we're gonna talk a little bit about sex semen and its role and, and how IVF as a technology could well be complementary to it. So to, by way of introduction, um, for those that aren't aware of this, we have about a one, one and a half million dairy cows in Ireland. And annually for the last number of years, we have about 800,000 calves that are registered to have had a dairy sire. So that the, the objective here of using artificial insemination to generate the next, the next generation is to make sure that there's high genetic merit heifers coming on stream every year. So this is what dairy farmers do. They, they, they use high genetic merit bulls to, to generate elite calves. And um, so they're interested in the female aspect. So half of these calves are valuable. That's the female half. They're going to go on and become cows and, and provide a valuable contribution to the farm. What about the other half? So the other half is becoming a bit of a problem here for the, the dairy industry. So that the male offspring here are selected for dairy traits, but they can never express them. So they have poor beef merit, and as a result, they have low economic value. 
So here in the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to I'm going to ask uh, give you some information on what is sex semen. Does it work? If it did work and we markedly reduced the number of male dairy calves, where would the next generation of elite male dairy bulls come from? And then lastly, introduce the concept of generating beef calves from dairy cows. Nucleus and in sperm cells, that nucleus is found in the sperm head. So you can see here in this, in this image, we've got a sperm head and here's the, the tail, which provides the, the propulsion to get the sperm to move. So, Technology has been developed called fluorescence activated cell sorting, and it relies on fluorescence to identify whether or not a sperm cell contains an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. So the first step is the, 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 the semen is um, a, a fluorescent DNA binding dye is added to the semen. And of course that will readily bind to the DNA in the nucleus. Now, remember in the last slide, I said that the female X chromosome contains 4% more DNA. So if we have more DNA, when we excite this fluorescent dye, we should get more fluorescence. So that's the challenge of fluorescence activated cell sorting is to try and identify the X and the Y chromosome sperm based on differences in fluorescence. Now in this cartoon here, we've got sperm in single file passing through this flow cytometer. Um, and, and so these have already, these sperm cells have already been incubated with the fluorescent dye. This laser excites the dye and immediately after that, there is additional apparatus to measure the amount of fluorescence. If it identifies it as an X chromosome sperm, it'll uh, apply an electrical charge. If it's a Y chromosome sperm, it'll identify a different, it'll, it'll attach a different electrical charge. And then we've got these charge elect deflector plates here, which try and direct the sperm one way or another. So you can see here the pink sperm are going into the, the, the pot of purified X chromosome sperm. The blue ones are going here to this pot of purified Y chromosome sperm. And you'll see here a lot of them are going down into this waste. And that's just basically where the, the device can't determine quickly enough whether or not the, it's, it's an X chromosome sperm or a Y chromosome sperm. So it just puts it into this waste pot. Now in this diagram, everything happening, what, what you're viewing here is sperm cells passing through at about one cell per second. But in reality, this apparatus is operating at about 50,000 cells per second. So there's no time to hang around. If, there's, if the decision can't immediately be made, it just puts it into the waste. Uh, and moves on to the next cell. 50,000 cells a second probably sounds like a lot, but, but that speed is actually the major limitation or it's a, it's a real bottleneck in the ability to, to process enough sperm cells to be able to produce uh, adequate sperm for, for each individual AI straw. So thinking here about if you're, if you're a dairy farmer and you're, you're thinking about your herd breeding strategy, we currently have three different types of semen to think about. We've got conventional dairy semen, which has been available um, you know, for, for, for well over half a century now. So this is semen that's produced from dairy bulls, um, but it's not, not been sorted. We've also got conventional beef semen. And now we've also got sex semen. So let's think about the normal situation here that we've had in Ireland for, for well over 50 years now. So with conventional semen, in this diagram here, I'm, I'm showing the, the heifers as being a smaller animals and there's a small cohort of them and then the cows are over here. So what, what we typically see here is an effort to get conventional dairy semen put into the heifers, get them in calf to, to dairy AI. These are typically the highest merit animals in the herd. So there's a benefit in trying to get replacements from these animals. And then most of the cows are also inseminated with conventional dairy semen. I'm showing you here some, some animals getting beef semen perhaps because they're poor genetic merit or, or, or there's no desire to get replacements from these animals. Now at the start of the breeding season, no animals are pregnant. So like Stephen Moore pointed out, there's a big effort in the first three weeks to get as many cows pregnant as possible. After the first three weeks, so we're into weeks four to six here, typically the heifers are now running with a stock bull and that's, that's often a, a beef stock bull. So these are any heifers that repeat or, or, or get bred for the first time in weeks four to six are typically going calf to a beef bull. Some cows might be given another chance with uh, conventional dairy semen, and some cows are, are still going to get beef semen. But once you get into the latter part of the breeding season, there's usually a switch to either completely using beef AI or relying on beef stock bulls. And you can see here in this diagram, I'm showing you that most of the cows are getting pregnant at the start of the breeding season, and it's getting fewer and fewer as we get to the end. And if we look at the calf crop that's arising from this, brief, this, this breeding strategy, the objective here is to make sure that we have enough animals for the next generation of, of cows in the herd. So we've got 30% female dairy calves. These are valuable. 
We've got 40% of the calves that are beef cross. These are also valuable and, and easy to market. Uh, this, there's, a, there's a ready demand for these calves. But the problem here is this 30% of male dairy calves. So, so very few of these are needed for, for breeding purposes and they themselves have poor beef merit. So they're, they're, they're uh, economically uh, low value. So let's move to an alternative situation where we're use, relying on sex semen. So here in this example, we're going to use sex semen on the heifers because they're the best merit animals in the herd and uh, also the best fertility animals in the herd. So, so most likely to go in calf. We're going to use sex semen on some of the cows. Again, the best, best genetic merit animals in the herd, the most fertile cows in the herd. And then the remaining cows are going to get beef semen. Any animals that repeat at any point during the, the remainder of the breeding season are going to be uh, put in calf to beef semen. What would be the effect of that on the resulting calf crop? So here you see here, we're still able to generate 30% of the offspring being female dairy, but now we're up on two thirds of the calf crop being crossbred beef animals. And we're down to only 3% of the animals being, being male dairy. So, so a real transformation of the, the calf crop arising. What's the fertility like with this sex semen product? So um, I'm just gonna briefly outline some um, results of a study we did a couple of years ago now. So, so we can synchronize animals to ovulate at a, at a fairly tightly defined time. So it involves a 10 day protocol. Um, so you can see here, we've got a 10 day window from when we start to the time of AI. And there's a number of treatments that occur during this period here to, to make sure that this happens, but it's highly effective. We can really tightly control when animals are going to ovulate. So we enrolled 24 herds in this study and, and over 2000 cows were enrolled in the study. And within each herd, cows were assigned to receive either conventional semen or they received sex semen. Now the conventional semen and the sex semen were generated from the, the same ejaculate. So it was what, what they call a split ejaculate procedure. And we had three bulls on the study and every herd got the same mix of conventional and sex semen from every bull. These are the overall results we saw. So here on the, we've got the, the pregnancy rate here, sometimes called the conception rate or pregnancy per AI. And we've got our two treatments here. So for the conventional semen, in dairy cows, we got a conception rate of 61%. And with the sex semen, that was down to 50%. Sometimes we, in, in sex semen, we talk about the relative pregnancy rate. And what that's referring to is how well did the sex semen perform relative to the conventional. And in that study, it was about 82% as good. So, so this, this, this figure here of 50% is about 82% of the 61% the, the figure that was recorded for conventional. But there was a lot of variation between herds. So this, this is each one of the 24 herds divided up here into the, the, the third of the herds with the best performance, the intermediate third of herds, and the poorest third of herds. And here we've got the, the pregnancy rate here again on this y-axis. Um, so you can see here that for the, the, the best third, conventional and sex were essentially the same. The intermediate third of the herds, there was, there was a growing gap. And it was, there was really poor performance then on, on another one third of the herds. Important to note here though, the cows in this final third were actually high fertility, very good fertility performance with the conventional semen, but a big drop off in performance with the sex. And I guess it's really important to, to, to wonder why would sex semen perform so poorly here when it performed so well with these herds over here? I mean, it's the same bulls, it's the same ejaculates. Um, and, and we can't say it's, it's a cow factor. We can't say it's because of the synchronization. So it's kind of indicating that that final piece of the puzzle, how the, how the straws are handled on the day of AI, um, the, the actual manipulation of the, the semen before it gets into the reproductive tract of the cow is a lot more critical for sex semen than it is for conventional. So a future with sex semen, sex semen use is set to increase. That's going to give us a diminished number of male dairy calves. That's a good thing. That's exactly what we want. But we still require um, elite merit male dairy calves to be born to go on and become the next generation of elite bulls for use in AI. So is there a role for assisted reproductive technologies to produce elite male dairy calves? And also something to think about, in the future, we're gonna have an increased number of non-replacement calves. So these are calves that we, we have a finite number of re replacement heifers required. What do we do with all the other cows we need to get pregnant? So is there, a, is there a role for assisted reproductive technologies to increase the calf crop, the, the beef value of the calf crop? So one thing we wanna talk about here is, is embryo production and on this, diagram here, I'm showing you the first seven days of embryo development. And this, this happens normally in the oviduct, as far as about here, and then it eventually makes it, makes it into uterus for, for this, this period here around day six to day seven.
But this is a seven day window of cell division um, and, and, and increasing cell number. And it all happens within this membrane. And after that day seven, the, the material inside in this membrane hatches out and starts to rapidly elongate and differentiate. But the, the, the point to note here is that you can actually recreate all of these events in vitro. This can all be done in a lab. Um, so once you've got good oocytes and sperm cells, you can get as far as here in a lab environment. Here's the first calf that was born using in vitro embryo production in, in 1981. Um, so, so since that time, over a million calves have been born to this technology. And here we've got um, some trends on, on recent numbers for total embryo production. So this is embryos that are produced in the normal way in the reproductive tract and in vitro embryo production. And you can see that it, it's, it's, it's steadily rising. This is the total global figure here in this solid black line. But you can see that most of that is being driven by trends in South America and North America and relatively little in other parts of the world, including Europe. So the traditional method of breeding is we have elite bulls, we have elite cows and heifers, and they're, they, they're mated uh, in, in a, using a artificial insemination, but we get a single bull dam combination per year. And that gives us one calf per year and relatively slow genetic gain. So how could we change that? So here, there's a number of acronyms here. OPU stands for oocyte pickup. This is uh, an ability to harvest oocytes from live donors. In vitro fertilization, in vitro embryo production, followed by embryo transfer. So how would this work? So we could we get the exact same elite bull and elite cow or heifer, same donor animals here. But in this case, we're more intensively trying to collect oocytes from these animals. So once a week, perhaps collect oocytes from this elite donor over here, conduct IVF, in vitro embryo production. This would allow us to have multiple bull dam combinations per year. We can produce eight to 12 embryos per month. An individual donor could now have more than 16 calves per year. And because you're putting a lot of pressure or selection pressure on this, on this combination here, it's going to facilitate accelerated genetic gain. The donors, important to note that we have a lot of flexibility here. The donors can be prepubertal, eggs can be collected early postpartum, and they can even be collected from pregnant dams. So there's a lot of uh, flexibility in the ability to, to, to generate these uh, oocytes. Uh, in the next talk, Dave is going to talk about generation interval a little bit, and, and obviously an ability to do this is going to collect, collect oocytes from prepubertal donors is also going to have an effect on the generation interval. The other thing, so, so that last slide really only applies to, to the very top end of the uh, genetic merit animals. It, it's not really something that's going to be applicable to all dairy farmers, but this next one could be potentially applicable. So this is commercial beef embryos. Again, we've got a, uh, here we're collecting ovaries from the slaughterhouse. So after, after a heifer, a beef heifer has been slaughtered, collect the ovaries and bring them back to the lab. We're gonna conduct in vitro fertilization with, a, with a, a bull of a particular breed that will be different to the, the breed of the, the, the beef heifer. So the oocytes can only be collected once post slaughter, obviously. Again, bring it back to the lab, IVF, IVP embryo production. Bull dam combinations to maximize offspring heterosis. We want healthy, vibrant, um, calves coming from this. The embryos would then be transferred to dairy cow surrogate dams. And the idea here is, could we get really premium quality beef coming from dairy offspring? So, so these dairy calves could be somewhere between 75 and 100% beef breed offspring. So to conclude, to answer the, the question we posed at the beginning, you know, sex semen really is a powerful technology. It allows us to select the best stems and use those best stems to generate the next generation of heifer calves. For the dairy farmer, this will, this will bring some rearing and management benefits. You know, all the dairy calves are born together at the start. Everything else could be a, a beef cross calf. And ultimately, that gives you a more valuable, more marketable, more saleable calf crop. IVP embryos, you know, th these are all ideas at this stage. We, we don't have any solid data on, on how well this will work in Ireland, but, but we, we are uh, in the process of implementing a trial for 2021. And the, the expectation is that it's going to allow accelerated genetic gain by targeting the best stems with the best sires, and also potentially have a big effect on the beef value of calves from dairy cows. I just want to finish by acknowledging a lot of collaborations that are involved in this work, both academic, um, ICBF and UCD, and financial from Dairy Levy Trust, Department of Ag, and a number of industry collaborators that are involved in, in, in facilitating this work. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Pat. 
Hey, Stephen, thanks very much for that. Uh, amazing technologies down, down the road for us, uh, which will have a big impact. Uh, it's amazing the new technologies are coming. Okay, we go on to our final speaker now, uh, David Kenny, which will talk about early life nutrition of young bulls, which is very important too. So over to you, David. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is David Kenny, and in this short uh, webinar this morning, I'm going to just cover some of the work that we've conducted over the last six or seven years, looking at aspects of fertility in bulls with specific reference to try, trying to advance sexual maturity and availability of high quality semen, uh, particularly from um, young dairy bulls. Uh, this is this work has been uh, funded to the Department of Agriculture and more recently to Science Foundation Ireland. And before I go on, I'd just like to acknowledge the significant contribution of my colleagues at the University of Limerick and also at University College Dublin to this work. So why are we interested in advancing sexual development in the young bull? Well, you know, as Stephen, as Stephen Butler uh, alluded to earlier, I suppose the genetic interval would say really limits uh, gain, genetic gain in cattle. You know, in that it's much longer, we'd say, than a lot of the other, I suppose, main livestock species that we're, that we're, that we deal with. Uh, and in its simplest terms, that's really the average age of the parents when the offspring are born. So anything that we can do really, we'd say, to get, you know, particularly genetically elite animals, um, you know, breeding at a younger age, will obviously, we'd say, help to advance the rate of genetic gain. So genomic selection, we'd say, has really accentuated, I suppose, an necessity for that, this in recent times, in that now, you know, we can predict, we'll say, the genetic merit and identify genetically elite animals literally within weeks of birth, you know. But if we cannot get, we we'll say, semen from young bulls at a young age, and certainly during the potentially the first breeding season, we'll say, or indeed, you know, breeding heifers, we we'll say, to calf down at two years of age, well, then obviously, you know, we're not utilising, we'll say, or harnessing that technology to, it, to its uh, greatest extent. And this is particularly important within the, the context of seasonal grass-based pasture production based systems that we have here in Ireland, where essentially um, there's you know, a very condensed breeding period in the spring, late spring to early summer. And essentially, if young bull isn't used, we'll say within its first breeding season, well, then it may well be passed out in terms of genetic merit the following year. So there's a lot of pressure in terms of trying to get semen and high quality semen from these young animals at a young age. So obviously to achieve that, the animals have to undergo puberty and subsequent sexual maturation, which in the young bull, typically occurs somewhere between a month and two months after puberty is attained. So again, the earlier that the animal can be uh, pubertal, um, the air, the, the, obviously the, the quicker the semen will be available from that animal. Now we do know that semen production from these young peripubertal bulls, you know, in the first months after um, they achieve puberty, is much, much poorer, we'll say, and much less quantity available than their more um, mature um, uh, the, the contemporaries. And again, it can, you know, a young bull might only produce from a third to half the semen yield of a mature bull in its first year at stud. So we know that a number of environmental, I suppose, influences, as well as genetics, obviously would say, can affect um, the sexual development, the rate of sexual development in, in cattle, both males and females. And in terms of the bull, we do know, we'll say, that of the environmental I suppose, influences early life nutrition in particular, would we'll say, has a particularly important effect in terms of advancing the rate of sexual maturity. And as I say, you know, generally we'll say dairy breeds will be pubertal earlier than, than, uh, than, than beef breeds. Um, but essentially, you know, nutrition, you know, and the, the level of nutrition the animal is exposed to, particularly in the first few months of life, you know, has a particularly um, strong influence in terms of the rate of sexual development. Now, we know that equally, while it's, it's still, I suppose, the exact biological basis for the effect of nutrition on sex, the rate of sexual gain is um, still unknown. It's likely mediated through, you know, many complex interactions between neuroendocrine or, in other words, hormones, you know, and peptides within the brain, you know, uh, reacting to signals coming from peripheral tissues, such as, for example, the stomach, adipose tissue, the liver. In other words, key metabolic hormones that signal to the brain that the, the state of, of the metabolic state, would say, or the state, nutritional state of the animal. And the better that is within reason, particularly during the early, early months of um, life, you know, the quicker that the sexual maturation process will occur. And we do know, would say there, you know, that the timing of nutritional intervention is very, very important. Uh, and we've carried out a number of uh, studies in that area. And I'll just briefly outline one of the main ones now in a, in a moment. 
So the first of those, I suppose, one of the, the main studies that we conducted was we looked at the effect of plain nutrition during the first six months and the subsequent six months of life in young host infusion bowls um, and its effect on age of puberty and post-pubertal uh, semen production and aspects of fertility. And this work is published in the Journal of Dairy Science. So we started off with about 80 post infusion bull calves. They were two, two weeks of age. They were all purchased from a small number of high uh, health status farms. Um, and they were then allocated to either a high plain nutrition, which is essentially about um, 10 litres of milk per cholesterol at 15% reconstitution rate um, per day, up to, up to weaning, um, or, in, or a lower um, allocation of milk powder. Um, and again, the target uh, growth rates there were about a kilogram a day or close to it for the high uh, plain nutrition and about a half a kilogram a day for the lower plain nutrition. And if they stay, so after weaning in calves on the high were essentially offered the ad libitum concentrate, whereas those on the low received about a kilogram of concentrate and good quality forage. At six months of age then, calves were either remained on the high plane nutrition or the low plane nutrition that they were originally on, or they were swapped over to the opposite plane nutrition. So we ended up then having four groups from six months onwards right up to puberty, you know. Um, so again, animals that were on high from two to two weeks of age up to six weeks of age or six months of age sorry um and st stayed on high thereafter went from high to low went from low uh to high or stayed you know on a, low, a relatively low plain nutrition with a, with a half a kilogram a day target uh um average daily gain so i suppose the bottom line what was the effect would say of that on age of puberty and we see here are four treatments again are high high always on a high plain nutrition High, low, high during care food, switched over to lower uh, plain nutrition after six months of age, low throughout and low to high. And you can see here, if we just focus here on the, the animals that were on a high plain nutrition during the first six months of life, we can see that there were pubertal anything from, you know, a month to six weeks earlier than their contemporaries that were on a low plain nutrition during the first six months of life. Irrespective of whether those calves that were on a low plain nutrition during the first six months of life, you know, were swapped over to a high plain nutrition thereafter. So essentially what this is telling us is that if calves start off poorly in terms of growth rate or I suppose metabolic um, uh, status, you know, feeding them better after six months of age, you know, it, it, to the to point of ad, offering them ad libitum concentrate will not advance their, their age of puberty by even a day, you know. So it's really, really important if we want to get the semen from these young animals, get them pubertal at a young age, that they're offered a high plane nutrition, you know, certainly during the first, you know, three, four, five months of age. So I suppose to get more in-depth information on this, we've carried out a range of, I suppose, uh, in-depth molecular type of studies where we have collected a host of, you know, um, important tissues, including different parts of the brain, um, the uh, testes, and different metabolic hormones, including the liver, adipose tissue, for example. And we've subjected those to really in-depth, we'll say, laboratory analysis in an effort to try to identify the key genes and the key proteins that are, that are regulating the effect of early life nutrition on um, sexual development, but also to, to identify what are the key, kind of key, the key genes ultimately that regulate sexual development so that we can go further then maybe and look for variants or SNPs as they call them within uh, these genes and build them in as part of our national genomically assisted breeding program. Okay, so that, those, I suppose that two pronged approach really is what we're after, you know, to essentially devise better nutritional strategies and understand what's happening, but ultimately also to identify the key genes that regulate earlier sexual development and build those into the genomically selected uh, breeding program. We're integrating using a complex, um, I suppose, bioinformatics or mathematical models, essentially would say, you know, to integrate all the relationships between all these different genes. And again, as I say, to try to identify the key genes and variants within those genes and their associations with earlier um, and more advanced sexual development. And ultimately as well, you know, we're following it through looking at semen quality and, 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 and semen availability. So I, I think I've, I, I, I hope that I've uh, um, provided evidence there that if we feed calves better during the first six months of life, certainly, you know, that we will advance the age of puberty, you know, and, may, and I suppose ultimately resulting in semen being available at a younger age. You know, but, you know, we were also obviously interested, we'll say, what impact did that regime have on the characteristics of the semen, we'll say, and ultimately the fertility, we'll say, the sperm. So 
we were, as I said, we conducted a number of studies then to look at the latent or knock-on effects, essentially, of those early life nutritional uh, regimes on subsequent uh, semen quality and quantity. We collected semen on a monthly basis from about 8 to 17 months of age, and we found that bulls on the high plane nutrition had a semen um, a, a available earlier and of a greater quality and a greater sperm concentration with greater sperm motility. And these were all assessed using the automated, computerized, uh, and an objective, I suppose, fashion, um, semen evaluation system that we have, or CAS as it is known. This study are, there just really uh, indicates, I suppose, some calculations that we conducted, looking at the effects of our four different nutritional regimes on you know, the number of straws would say that would from about 12 to 15 months of age, which would be a key time if you want to utilize that young bull, you know, within its first breeding season. Um, and the value would say of those straws then that could be collected would say from a typical ejaculate from these type of young animals. And if you can see here, again, the two columns on the left hand side indicate those calves that were fed a high plane nutrition or those bulls that were playing, uh, fed a high plane nutrition as calves uh, during the first six months of life. And essentially, in any of those ejaculates that we collected from between 12 and 50 months of age, those animals on a high plane nutrition as calves had about twice or produced uh, twice as much uh, semen and ultimately produced twice as much semen straws as those on a lower plane nutrition as calves, irrespective of whether they're off the high plane nutrition, you know, during the, se the second six months of life. And ultimately, obviously, we'd say that doubled the value, we'd say, of each ejaculate collected from those animals. So the air station would say, or the rearers would say, those calves will, 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 will I suppose, return um, on their investment in terms of better nutrition very, very quickly, would say, by undertaking such a regime. We also then went in collaboration, we'd say, with uh, Pat Lonigan's lab at UCD uh, to look at um, the IVF-based fertility. Now, looking at the field fertility would be impractical in this type of study, firstly because of the number of bulls, but equally because the animals were not purebred animals. But this, you know, as Steve Butler has already outlined, um, IVF-based fertility is a good proxy, you know, for um, the potential fertility, would say, of a, of a bull. And this table there, again, looks at uh, four different treatments. We collected semen, as I said, from those animals. And the, the semen that was used for this was when they were from about uh, 15 and 16 months of age. Though that se semen was incubated with oocytes uh, derived from, from heifers. Um, you know, with a very significant number, over a thousand would say, was say, subjected would say to semen. In, in each case here, there's about four to five uh, bulls from each of the four treatments um, uh, used. And ultimately, what the data is telling us that early embryo development would say, and development right up to the blasted stage, and any of you that are involved in embryo transfer will realize that that's the stage at about seven days of age that typically um, the embryos will be transferred, would say, to recipients. But we found no. I suppose, either a positive or negative effect of our early life nutritional regimes on the uh, development of those uh, early, early embryos. So certainly there's no negative impact of, you know, offering these calves a very high plane nutrition during the first six months of life on their potential uh, fertility of their sperm. The work has uh, emanated in terms of, you know, very high quality publications. And again, these are still being generated, we'll say, as we speak. Um, and again, that's important in terms of the validity of the work and that it's scrutinized, I suppose, by an international professional scientific audience. So then just to summarize, um, I think I provided evidence just to say that, to show that uh, earlier onset of puberty, or early life care um, with nutrition leads to earlier onset of puberty and the availability of same as saleable semen, ultimately allowing that young bull to be used in a high, uh, that highly genetically, I suppose, elite young bull uh, to be used, would say, effectively within its first season. Um, it, it, the better nutrition also, I suppose, um, advances steroidogenesis, which is again testosterone production and testicular development. Again, you know, obviously very important for sperm, sperm um, production. We found no effect, would say, of the early life nutritional regime on fertility, IVF based fertility. We have identified a number of key genes and uh, key molecular pathways within both the brain, testes, and other metabolic tissues. That, we want, that we're following up at the moment in terms of identifying those key genes that could potentially be built in to our national genomically uh, selected, uh, selected um, breeding program. We're at the moment, as part of a very large on-farm fertility, we've collected semen from about 1,150 young bulls on farms. Um, and we're 
we're looking at G- the DNA, I suppose, the screening the DNA of those animals and relate it back to fertility related and sperm quality related parameters. And overall, we hope we'd say to get an improved knowledge of the, bio, the complex biochemical regulation of sexual development in the human body. Again, as I say, to try to improve ultimately, would say our accuracy in identifying at a younger age these young bulls that can become pubertal earlier and provide better quality semen, you know, making them ultimately usable in the first season. And uh, on top of that, we obviously equally want to uh, mirror that that work with the development of better nutritional regimes. To, to make sure that, the, the, that these animals are reared in a consistent fashion, which ultimately will uh, dictate their av- availability for breeding with the on a regularly uh, early um, um, uh, opportunity. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks for everyone and goodbye and stay safe.